we've been looking at a series of extensions to our baseline case where we have a functional with an integrand capital F that involves x, u, and u prime, and we've extended to higher order derivatives. We've looked at different types of boundary conditions, such as natural boundary conditions. And now we want to look at the case where we have multiple, in this case two, independent variables to see how things are different. So in the case where we have one independent variable, it's a one-dimensional problem. u is just a function of x. And so our Euler equations end up being ordinary differential equations. Now we're going to see with multiple independent variables. In this case, two independent variables. We're talking about two-dimensional physical problems. And our Euler equations will end up being partial differential equations. Now in a relative sense, the hardest Euler equation we derived was the first one because it was our first one. This is truly, in an absolute sense, the hardest, most difficult case to derive. But we're going to follow exactly the same steps, same procedure as before, and we'll just see how things are modified a bit in order to treat the two-dimensional or indeed the three-dimensional case as well. So this is indeed a bit hard, so it's no time to be lazy. So we have one dependent variable u, but now it's a function of two independent variables x and y. It's a two-dimensional domain. So our functional i is a function of u, which is then a function of x and y. So it's two-dimensional, so now we have an area integral over x and y. And our capital F integrand is a function of x and y, our two independent variables, our dependent variable, and its first derivatives. The u sub x and u sub y are partial derivatives with respect to x and y, respectively. So subscripts are indicating partial derivatives. A is the domain in the two-dimensional plane x, y. And that's bounded by the curve c. And then ds is a little differential element along c. OK, so we'll go through exactly the same steps as before. We take the variation of i, set it equal to 0. We'll do the integration by parts and get the natural boundary conditions. So same steps as before, just now for the two-dimensional scenario. So I take the variation of i and set it equal to 0. So I can take the variation inside the integral. Again, as always, as long as the bounding curve c does not vary, then that's OK. We can take the variation inside. And as the variation of f is a function of x, y, u, u sub x, and u sub y. So then we have a term for each of those in the variation of capital F, partial F, partial x, delta x, partial F, partial y, delta y, partial F, partial u, delta u, partial F, partial u sub x, delta u sub x, and finally partial F, partial u sub y, delta u sub y. So again, a term for each of these variables acting as if they are independent variables. Again, remember the logic, however, that x and y, in this case, actually do not vary. x is an independent variable, y is an independent variable. We know what they both are before the problem began. So therefore, they do not vary, and delta i and delta y are both 0. So the first two terms are gone, and we're left with these three terms. Now you can see I've written out the partial derivatives. So delta u sub x is the variation of partial u partial x, and delta uy is the variation of partial u partial y. So let's think about this term right here. Remember before, we said that the variation of the derivative of u we could switch the order of the variation of the derivative. They commute as long as u is, is smooth. And so that's the case here. So we can rewrite this as partial partial x of delta u. Likewise here, variation of partial u partial y is partial partial y of delta u. So we have the derivative of delta u, derivative of delta u with respect to x, and with respect to y. Now this is the stage where we would apply integration by parts in order to get these derivatives off of the deltas and onto the factors multiplying the deltas. So that's what we'll do here, except that now we have to do a two-dimensional version of integration by parts. So let's walk through that, but we're going to have to do a few steps beforehand in order to be prepared to do the so-called integration by parts. So I've color-coded the terms. You can see here the red term and then the blue term. So what I've done here is I've added and subtracted the same thing. Of course, those then cancel just to give back that original red term. But I'm going to add and subtract the same thing here for reasons that you'll see in a moment. Same thing for, for the blue term. So here is the original term. And then we're going to add and subtract the same thing. 
Now these two terms we're going to combine into one. So this is essentially reverse product rule. So I'm going to write this as partial partial x of partial f partial u sub x times delta u. If you perform this differentiation and use the product rule, you'll get back these two terms. And then this one right here is this one, just coming along for the ride. So we added and subtracted the same thing, took these two terms, combined them using the reverse product rule into this term, and then just carried this one forward. Same thing for the blue terms. So this one will just be carried forward. These two we can combine using a reverse product rule as partial partial y of partial f partial u sub y delta u. Now it's not so clear at this point why I did this and how this is going to help us do the so-called integration by part. We'll see how that works out in a moment. But let's just think about the two-dimensional version of integration by parts. This was discussed in chapter one in the section on integration by parts, and it's given by the divergence theorem, or sometimes known as Gauss's theorem. Again, essentially, you can think of it as the two-dimensional version of integration by parts, or as it's presented in chapter one, integration by parts is a 1D special case of the divergence theorem. And this is really powerful. Look what it says. It says that if I take the divergence of a vector field V, so del dot V, that represents an expansion of the vector field. We take that integral over the entire area. So this is the area enclosed by C that comprises our domain. And that's equal to the integral of V dot N ds. This little loop on the integral sign signifies that we're integrating all the way around the closed contour C along ds. Now N is an outward facing normal everywhere on C. Now why is this so powerful? It's so, it's so powerful because it's taking an area integral and expressing it as a line integral. So an integral over the entire enclosed area A is being set equal to the integral along the curve C that bounds that A. And let's just think about how we can define the V then as a vector that will suit our needs in this particular context that we have. So let's just take a generic vector V, P times I plus Q times J, just written two-dimensional in Cartesian coordinates. The N is an outward facing unit vector. That would be dy dsi minus dx dsj. That's just from differential geometry. That del is the grading operator. That's partial partial xi plus partial partial yj, again, in 2D Cartesian coordinates. All right, so we have the vector V. We have the vector del, or nabla, and we have the vector n. So we can do those dot products. So del dot v, well that's partial partial x of p plus partial partial y of q, and that's integrated over the entire domain a. And then on the right hand side we have the integral around c, and that's v dot n, so that's p dy ds minus q dx ds, integrating with respect to s. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, if we can figure out what the p and the q are in this vector for our particular problem, then we can apply the divergence theorem to it. So if you look at this first term, partial partial x of p and partial partial y of q. So if I look here, I see I have a partial partial x of this thing in parentheses and partial partial y of this thing in parentheses. So let's make this the p and we'll make this the q. So P is partial F partial U sub X delta U, and Q is partial F partial U sub Y delta U. And again, I've, you know, I've underlined the terms, doubly underlined terms, so you can kind of track through the derivation where those terms come from. Okay, so if these are the P's and the Q's. I substitute those in, and I can then write this as P times dy ds minus Q times dx ds. So that's what we have here. P times dy ds minus Q times dx ds. Now what's left in the area integral? Well, if you look at what's left, there's this term, the partial f partial u delta u term, and then there's these two terms. And so that's what you see here, these three terms. And then these two underlying terms are the ones that we use in the divergence theorem with the P and the Q defined as we have here, 
to get this integral along the boundary C. So just like an integration by parts in the, in the 1D case, you have a term that's evaluated at the boundary, which is just the two endpoints, and then an integral that's evaluated throughout the entire domain. Here, here is the integral evaluated throughout the entire domain, and here is now an integral, but it's a term evaluated just at the boundary of the domain, which is C. Then we apply the usual argument. These two terms added together have to equal zero. Because this term is only evaluated along the curve C, whereas this term is evaluated throughout the entire area A, these two terms in general will not cancel each other out. So they both have to be zero by themselves. So that we have zero plus zero is equal to zero. So this one being zero gives us the Euler equation, which, is the, which are the terms in square brackets equal to zero across the entire domain. And then this second term also requires this set of terms in square brackets that multiply delta u to also be zero at every point along the boundary. So that gives us our Euler equation and our boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are either that u is specified, so they're known, Dirichlet, essential, and so on. So u is known such that delta u is zero, and this term goes away. If that's not the case, then we have to take the term in square brackets, set that equal to zero, and that's what we have here. This has to be zero if u is not specified, and therefore delta u is zero. So that's the natural boundary condition for this two-dimensional case. Now let's just take a little bit closer look at this. So the first two terms are precisely what we had before. Now instead of u x, which is partial u partial x, that would be du dx, which would be u prime in the 1D case. And in the 1D case as well, we'd have d dx instead of partial partial x. So these two terms come precisely from our previous developments, completely consistent with them. And then notice this term is exactly like this term, except instead of x, we have y. Instead of x, we have y. So once again, the extension to two dimensions here is, is very intuitive. It's exactly what you'd expect based on our previous developments. So we get this additional term for y, and it looks just like the term we have for x. Same idea for the natural boundary condition. If nothing changed with y, if it was one dimensional, then this would go away, and that would give us that partial f partial u prime would have to be equal to zero, and that was our natural boundary condition for the previous case. So once again, this more general case follows from the specific particular case that we looked at at the very beginning of the chapter.